Hello, good evening and welcome. I'm Neil Johnson. I am the chair of the AES UK section. Thanks to all those who took part in our recent election. And I'm host for tonight's webinar. So recently, digital to audio converters that claim to have resolutions up to 32 bits have become available. How do they possibly achieve such exalted levels of performance? Tonight's talk will be given by Jamie Angus Whitehead. Jamie is Emeritus Professor of Audio Technology at Salford University. Her career in industry and academia has spanned optics, acoustics, analog and digital signal processing. Jamie has invented a variety of diffusers, direct processing of super audio CD signals, and one of the first four channel digital tape recorders. She has worked in signal processing, analog circuit design, and numerous other audio technology topics and has been active throughout the AES for 30 years. Jamie has been awarded an AES Fellowship, the Institute of Acoustics Peter Barnett Memorial Award and the AES Silver Medal Award for her contributions to audio and acoustics. So Jamie's talk will begin in a moment and take us up to about eight o'clock-ish or thereabouts and happy to answer any questions you have. So feel free to use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Following the talk, we will then adjourn to a Zoom meeting room where we can have a more one-to-one -one, um, interaction and Jamie's happy to take questions and provide answers. And we'll post a link into the, uh, the, the chat uh, during the talk. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to hand over the microphone to Jamie. Hello, welcome everyone. Let's just share the screen. Um, and you'll see um, I've the, the slides have been designed to give you space to put um, my video off to one side and um, uh, look at the questions as well. So one thing just there. OK, so let's start. So right at the beginning of digital audio, and I can actually remember this, um, Analog to digital conversion at 44.1 and 48 kilohertz was a was a real problem. Um, you could get such converters. 14 bits was pretty much what you could get off the shelf uh, for a price, and 16 bits was very difficult and very expensive. Nowadays, um, you look at the catalogs out there. Um, you can get 32 bit conversion fairly readily, and at rates as high as 384 kilohertz at comparatively low cost. You know, we're talking tens of pounds rather than thousands of pounds. And this is a, a, due to a combination of DSP and audio design. It's, it's almost like audio alchemy. And what the aim of this talk is to do is to say, well, how does this actually work? Um, so the talk's going to have this sort of structure. What are the issues for digital analog converters? A little bit of history. Um, then we're going to discuss the basic approach to how these converters might achieve their performance advantages. Look at first order noise shape digital analog converters and how to get higher order noise shaping out of them. Um, we're actually going to miss out the alternative approach. Um, there's a pulse width modulation method, but I don't, I've taken those slides out because I don't think we've got time to do it. And then we're going to discuss how you might apply dither to these things because it's, uh, you know, 32 bits is an awful lot of bits. And finally, have a, a fairly short brief conclusion and then we'll move on to questions. So the basic D to A, um, the simplest one one can think of is to have a binary weighted resistor digital to analog converter. And the idea here is very straightforward. We have a, a simple amplifier, we have inputs which are voltages, um, and we have a set of resistors that are weighted as binary resistors. So 10K would be the least significant bits, and then half of that, half of that, and half of that, um, for, uh, giving us progressively more significant bits. Um, and it's it's fairly simple uh, to work out how one of these things worked works. Um, and the trouble with it, though, is a 12-bit version of this would actually require uh, the largest scaling resistor to be 248 version times the smallest. So 
when you start looking at the sorts of converters we use, like a 20-bit converter would require a million to one range of resistance values, and clearly this gets rather difficult. So um, the resistor value is huge, um, but even that is uh, even only part of the problem. Components aren't perfect, and tolerance is actually a real problem. And tolerance tends to be measured as a percentage of the actual value of the resistor. So even a 0.1% resistor would have um, terrible trouble because it would be out by uh, amounts that would be much greater than um, the uh, higher significant bits. So the components are not perfect and tolerance is a problem and that leads to non-linearity and distortion. And in practice, the most significant bit has the most dramatic effect on the error. Um, Distortion actually depends on bit changes and is not proportional to signal amplitude. Now, this is quite an important point. It, when we were analog, um, although we had higher levels of distortion, they tended to be proportional to the amplitude of the signal. So something like tape would have third order distortion, um, which meant if you doubled the uh, signal level, you'd get eight times the distortion. But likewise, if you half the signal level, you get um, um, one-eighth of the distortion. So at low signal levels, which is where most audio signals live, we'd actually get really rather good performance. Um, and um, and it was it was a function of amplitude. Whereas digital distortion due to converters is much more like the Class B crossover distortion we see. The biggest, um, most significant bit of a... Um, a D to A converter is likely to be at the sign change point. There are ways of ameliorating that, but um, so we tend to get large amounts of distortion at comparatively low signal levels that aren't proportional to the signal level. And that tends to sound a lot more unpleasant um, when we get down to it. So what sort of linearities are we talking about? Well, the simplest one here is just the variation from step to step. Ideally, every single step on the D2A converter should be exactly the same voltage change as every other step. And if we do that, we get the picture on the left, which is a nice um, s staircase. In practice, due to component tolerances, we can find that the steps are not even, so that as we change the um, uh, input bit pattern, the uh, um, output changes, or uh, when we're trying to do it the other way around for A to D, um, linear changes in input voltage level are, are not associated with linear changes of the digital value. Um, <clears throat> It can get really rather bad. So, for example, here's a, here's one that's quite bad where we have it when we change from the code um, 011 to the code 100, it should step up, but in fact, the uh, output voltage steps down. Now, this is a, a non monotonic D to A converter, and as such, it would sound dreadful. Um, and obviously it's not something that we would want to happen, but it is something that can happen with um, component tolerances in D2A converters. So, just to sort of summarise, one of the problems with a binary weighted resistor and digital to analog converter is A, it's got a huge component range, and B, um, component tolerances have very large effects, and really it's very difficult to make one more than a few bits um, deep to uh, behave well and in a linear fashion. So what do we do? Um, this is a bit of a problem. The, the resistor range is a problem, and also the resistors don't actually fit into the natural resistor tolerance um, preferred value range. Right, just there we are. So, uh, sorry, just a second. I think I skipped. Yes, there we are. So, there's a different way of doing it, and that is the R2R ladder. Um, I'm sorry, this my computer's being a bit silly on um, moving slides across. So here, this is quite a clever idea. Um, this uses only two values of resistance. Um, 
it has a, a resistor value of R, um, which forms a sort of chain series chain of resistors, and it has two R, which are used as inputs for um, some sort of voltage reference, either connect to voltage reference and then ground. Um, and when you work through the maths, and uh, we're not going to do that here, it turns out that these form really rather a nice pattern of binary weighted um, attenuations that result in a, a, a nice regular um, set of binary weighted currents going into the summing node. Um, and that's highly useful because it's achieved with only two values of resistance. So we've got rid of the problem of the um, wide range of resistance. We now only have two resistors that we have to worry about. And it's fairly easy to make those with um, quite large good accuracy. Furthermore, it no longer deter is no longer needs absolute values, absolute resistor values to be correct. What's important now is that those relative values hold together. And again, that in general tends to be uh, a tighter tolerance um, that we can achieve with just those two resistors. So it's a useful um, network to use. But it still has problems with voltage tolerances. Um, um, this is sort of from, all right, it's from the 80s, so to put it in historical context when we we're looking at these converters, um, for the different resistances available to us, we were looking at um, matched tolerances of on the order of 0.1%, possibly as low as 0.05%. But those are still too large to achieve um, monotonic operation over even a 1 million to 1 range. Um, 0 .0, 0 0.1 is basically a 1,000 to 1. Um, so, you know, a 10-bit converter would be fairly straightforward, but a 20-bit converter really is not going to be able to do um, uh, cut the mustard there. With a bit of push you could get it to 12 bits and this is pretty much the state we were in when um, we were looking at 16-bit recording and the CD. Um, so how can we do any better than that? So you know, we've got some problems. The, the, the R2R digital time converter is um, much better. It's got a much smaller um, resistance range, 2 to 1. Relative resistor values are now important, which improves it. But even with all of those benefits, tolerance was still a problem. Um, so where do we go from there? How do we manage to get up to the... Um, even a 16-bit level, let alone 32-bit level. So, a little bit of history, which I'm going to throw in. When the compact disc came out, now, uh, some of you might not remember this, but I actually do remember this because I have the original bits of paper. Um, the first compact disc announcement was done in 1979. Um, that's not the date usually quoted for the release of the compact disc. And it was a 14-bit optical digital playback format. Um, and associated with that launch, Philips had actually developed a 14-bit DAC to match it. Um, and then everything went quiet. I remember this coming while I was doing my PhD and nothing happened for two to three years. And then 1982, uh, the compact disc was re-released uh, with much fanfare, only it was a 16-bit system. So... Um, in those days, developing analog high precision analog hardware on an IC for consumer use was not trivial. Um, Philips had to develop a 16-bit DAC in a hurry. Um, and what they did was they used a combination of oversampling and noise shaping, um, which got them there. Um, initially, it was dismissed by other manufacturers as a 
technical joke. But as we know, actually the oversampling method resulted in things that audibly sounded better than some of the competition. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have a little look at that in some detail because it's it's actually quite clever. I, I did ask the Philips engineers about this and they did say, yeah, they had to find some way of making their 14-bit part, um, which had taken quite a while to develop, to be usable fairly rapidly in order to meet the new requirements. So how did they do it? Well, the Philips 16-bit converter used a two-chip solution. They were using their 14-bit converter that they'd already developed, which was... Um, uh, but they... it was able to run at quite a bit faster than the normal CD rate. They could actually run it at four times the CD sampling frequency. So in front of it, they produced a digital oversampling filter um, and a requantizer that produced, took 16 bits in and produced 14 bits um, out at 176 or thereabouts kilohertz. Um, there's some quite clever stuff going on in that um, digital filter to meet the um, to fit it into the technical limitations we had for digital ICs in those days. And then finally a low-pass third-order Bessel to fit, fit it out. But how did that work? Well, oversampling by four actually gave them one extra bit of precision. So that took their 14 bits up to 15 bits. Well, how did that work? Well, it worked simply by oversampling your quantization noise, which you can think of as a little butter pat, was spread now over four times the bandwidth. So if we think of a, a little butter pat as being um, or clotted cream, for those in the south of England, um, you could uh, uh, represent the noise power due to the quantization of the signal. By spreading it over four times the frequency range, we got one quarter of the, the noise power at any given frequency. So when we work that out backwards in terms of voltage, we've got half the noise voltage over the audio band we're interested in and therefore um, one extra bit of um, precision from the uh, D2A converter. But that's still not enough because they only had a 14-bit converter. They needed one wafer thin extra bit. Um, and they did that by doing something called noise shaping, where they it, they um, filter produced a 28-bit output. They passed 14 bits on to the 14-bit converter, and they took the 14 bits that were chopped off, um, delayed it, and subtracted it from the uh, input signal, and that process essentially forced the error at DC to be zero and gave you a first order um, rise in error as you went up in frequency. Um, as a, a filter, basically an error feedback noise shaping filter structure. And uh, the computation is very simple because it's just a delay, which was easy to implement. Um, and the transfer function becomes that the output voltage is equivalent to the um, input voltage plus some sort of noise shaping function times the quantization noise. And where HZ had low noise, low gain, the noise was low gain. And it, it turns out that this filter ends up having a gain of two at the top of the frequency at two times uh, half the sampling frequency and a gain of zero at DC. So it effectively looks um, like, um, again, I've just gone two across. So, so there we have oversampling gave us um, one bit of uh, precision. And then if we look here, um, noise shaping got our voltage e even lower and gave us an additional bit. So we picked up our extra two bits using oversampling. So in the end, the combination of those two things actually gave us the two bits that let the, that 14 bit part that they'd spent so much time developing work in the new 16 bit system.
However, there's a bit of a problem with this because it was a multi-bit converter. It was a 14-bit D2A converter. And if you actually look at the noise, the... Um, let's see if I can get a laser pointer here. Um, up here, um, any errors in the D2A converter are outside the noise shaping loop. After all, this part was after all the signal processing. So any error in the digital to analog converter would actually come straight through to the output. So why did it work? Why did that Philips part work? Because they had a 14-bit converter with all the attendant errors, so it would have generated noise. Um, and um, those jet noise generated noise couldn't actually be shaped by the, the noise shaper. They would be reduced by oversampling um, if there were noise like. Well, what happened was actually the Philips engineers made an exceedingly good part. Here was their 14-bit accurate converter, but the actual error from the real converter over a reasonable domestic temperature range to about 50 degrees centigrade was better than 15 bits accurate, which meant uh, the oversampling would bring the um, that error down by f down to 16 bits. So they because they'd made a 15 bit accurate part, they could actually make a 16 bit converter work in this sort of fashion. However, doing much better than that, it was difficult, um, and I know they they didn't have a great time with this 16-bit part. They had to work quite hard on it to, to improve things. So what we really need to do in order to get good quality conversion is to have some way of shaping the error from a, um, a multi-bit D2A converter. This is a fairly typical signal path for a conversion system these days. Some sort of digital interpolation, which is easy to do these days. Um, some high-speed um, multi-bit sigma delta modulator using multiple bits, which will give us this sort of signal spectrum, which is fine. We've got great signal-to-noise ratio in our audio band, which we then put into a, a three-bit multi-level DAC. Now, a conventional multi-bit DAC. The, the mismatch error due to the um, practical errors and the components in it will result in digital analog component noise that um, completely swamps any benefit we got from noise shaping. What we really want is that DAC output noise to be shaped as well. But how do we do that? How do we get rid of that undesirable mismatch noise due to real component values um, to give us this sort of thing when we can't see the output of the digital to analog converter. We can see the input, we can provide a noise-shaped input to it, but there's no way of looking at that output. So this is why it seems like alchemy or black magic even, um, because what we want to do is shape, and, and what the current converters do is shape that noise, but how might they do it? Right, so the first thing they do is to get rid of the idea of using uh, any form of weighted resistor network to do the conversion. Um, and we go back to doing the simplest, simplest possible um, digital to analog converter, which is for every level we want to output, we have a separate source of voltage or current. Um, and all the, um, it's known as a thermometer code, so the idea is if we want to output a voltage of one, we, we switch one bit on. If we want to output three, we have three bits. If we wanted seven, uh, we'd have seven bits and so on and so forth. And here's an example there. Um, um, it's fairly easy to make. Uh, obviously, there are a lot of resistors involved, but again, with current IC technology, that's not, not difficult to do. And we can have lots of equal resistors all wired up in parallel to form a thermometer code um, type D2A converter. Now, this is quite important because then this is a key 
technology in here. Because all the resistors are the same, it doesn't matter which resistor you use. Um, if you want to output the voltage one of equal to one step, then you can select any one of those resistors and you'll output a voltage of one step. If you want to do three output three steps worth of voltage, then any three resistors will do. The resistor order doesn't matter, and that's a crucial bit um, that, that's in this system. So resistor order doesn't matter, and what that means is that if we... Um, the error magnitudes are all going to be similar because they're matched resistors on the same chip, um, and errors are effectively a random variation around some sort of mean average resistor value. So this gives us an alternative way of doing it. We take in our PCM, we convert it to a high data rate, multi-bit, um, low number of bits, say four bits, um, at high sample rate. We then convert the PCM to a thermometer code. So four bits um, would become at least 16 bits. Um, we'll discuss whether that's enough uh, later on. And then we put it into some sort of scrambling box uh, that outputs the DAC with equal weights. By scrambling the um, which resistors are used dynamically with each sample, we actually can make the mismatch noise white because the scrambling is independent of the output value. Um, and we convert systemic noise in our resistor tolerances into white noise at the output. And if we do that, um, we get something that looks like this. Um, Still not good enough, but we get a... Here's the noise-shaped input, and with 1%, or this is an example with quite extreme mismatch, um, then we find that we've converted the, the noise, the mismatch to noise, which is an improvement to distortion, but we're still going to get the frying bacon sound from our converter here. So what can we do next with this? Um, if the resistors are all the same and they can be used in any order, as long as the right number are activated, we can make the mismatch noise white. But what we want to do is to make the, um, the noise not white. We want to shape it. And it turns out we can do this, but we're going to have to make the mapping dependent on the output value. And I'm going to give you a go through uh, an example of this, which was, uh, again, another early method of doing digital to analog conversion. Right, so this is, a, this is not a serious suggestion for a circuit. This is a, um, uh, a thought experiment. Just suppose we could do this. If we took our input digital sil si signal and we integrated it, we'd end up with a, um, f uh, a frequency response that was falling as it went up in frequency. If we then put that into the di digital to analog converter with white, you know, one of these scrambling converters that gave us white noise as the mismatch noise coming out of it, um, and then after that digital to analog converter, we put it into a differentiator. What would happen would we'd have a flat audio spectrum at the output of this entire process. Don't worry about how practical it is. And our noise, our mismatch noise, would be shaped by the differentiator and would be low at low frequencies and high at high frequencies. So um, what we will have done then is shaped the digital to analog converter mismatch noise. Um, wouldn't that cause problems in practice? Well, if you did it actually like that, yes, it would. But before we dismiss it as a completely crazy idea, let's look at what that actually looks like if we did it with a thermometer mo mode code digital to analog converter. So what I've got here is I'm going to show the different bits that are set um, in um, 
this sort of structure, but using a thermometer code. So we've got an input coming in there. These are the values of my input samples. So this is the first sample input um, of three coming in, and we're going to integrate it. Um, we're going to keep in mind the previous integrated input because we're going to subtract the two to form a differentiated output. So obviously on the first stage, um, the input comes in, previous integrated is is zero, let's call it, and the output is three. Let's put in another value. Let's put in five. So now we integrate um, three plus five, it gets a bit bigger, but when we subtract the two samples off as expected, we get um, the desired sample to differentiate, differentiated output. Um, <clears throat> let's take it a bit further. Let's put in um, a sample value of 4. Again, the integrator value gets bigger, um, as does the previous integrated input, um, but the difference is still the desired sample voltage. And let's continue it one more for this example, where we put in a, a sample value of 6. Again, you can see that the output after the whole process is um, uh, 6 as desired because of the subtraction of the two differentiated outputs. Now, this is where it gets interesting. You'll have noticed I've put big bars here at a regular impost because remember that a thermometer code digital to analog converter doesn't care which order of um, resistors are switched on at any one time. To output a level of 6, all I want is 6 resistors to be switched on. To output 3, all I want is 3 resistors to be switched on. So, all the errors are the same uh, magnitude. The resistor order doesn't matter, so it's perfectly reasonable to wrap round the resistors so long as we have enough resistors to convert the differential output. So I wouldn't be able to put out 9, for example, because I've only got 8 resistors there. Um, but I could put out up to 8. Um, so let's see look what the same process looks like, but where we allow the, the value um, of the integrator to wrap round. What we get then is um, something that looks like this. We get... Um, in the integrated input goes in, that's fine. Switch three resistors on at the output of this converter. This this point here is effectively controlling the thermometer code. And then we add um, five things and we switch on the other five resistors. So far so good. Um, but then the next time round, instead of having to go on to high levels, we then switch on the first four resistors in our um, thermometer chain. I get an output voltage of four, and then when we put the six value of six on, we switch on six resistors, um, and we get our output of six. And you can see we've been chasing our tail round and round and round. And obviously, how fast it whizzes around that ring of resistors depends on the value of the sample you're putting in. Um, it makes the um, DC mis mismatch go to zero and the thermometer DAC looks like a ring. And in fact, the original implementation of this was called a, a ring digital to analog converter. So that's rather clever. Um, means we can use a finite number of resistors um, and by choosing how we allocate them to the, the sample values we can actually get first order noise shaping. Um, and this is this is basically what it does for you is if you remember we had beforehand we had um, a flat noise over that range, but now by using this technique we've got first order noise shaping and you can see we've gained some much better noise at low frequencies um, compared to just the simple random scrambling. In practice you need more resistors than your maximum value because clearly um, if you just had uh, if you used all the resistors up to put out a given value, you're not allowing any random variation to um, uh, make it 
approach the mean and have the noise round. So in practice, if I wanted to do um, a three bit conversion, I'd probably want to use something like um, 12 or so resistors, even though I would never switch those 12 on, um, just to make sure that I was keeping that random process going. But as they say in the um, uh, adverts, but can we do better? The answer is yes, there, we can do better. But to do that, we have to sort of look at what's going on with each individual switch when this um, system is working. So the differentiated result always uses less than the total number of resistors and we can uh, make the mismatch error zero at DC but obviously at higher frequencies it will be greater. And it, the point about it is um, we're using signal dependent resistor selection and that's a key. Um, in this case we're just using the next sequentially available resistors but can we do this a bit higher? So let's just think about what's going on. Um, and to make it a bit easier to see on a on a graph, I'm going to cut the thermometer code right down to uh, a four resistor thermometer code DAC with a zero DC error. Uh, and I'm going to be doing it trying to output a DC level of a quarter full scale. Now under that circumstance that's basically putting in one uh, outputting a value of one each time. Um, it's going to select the first resistor, then the second resistor, then the third resistor, then the fourth resistor, loop round second, first, second, third, fourth, and so on. Um, and only one resistor will be on at any one time incident. But all the visitors in the thermometer DAC would be visited in sequence. So let's just look at what that looks like in the time domain. Um, what it looks like in the time domain is that's the resistors being selected. You can see that the output is up for one bit and then down and then down for three time steps and then back up again. And the average level of that is going to be one quarter. And the same happening for all the other three outputs. So each output looks like a single bit sigma delta modulator um, for a quarter of the voltage that all add up to one. And that means we can sort of think about this multi-bit ring DAC as a, as a collection of sigma delta, one bit sigma delta module modulators, each controlling a one, a two level, a one bit DAC uh, which is just a resistor connected between two voltages, um, switched between two voltages, um, all cooperating to provide um, an overall analog output of VD that ends up being a constant voltage. So when we think about it that way, then we, we might want to rethink what we think a sigma delta modulator is. Instead of thinking it automatically as a comparator feeding back a digital value that then creates an error which then alters the output to be a plus or one to minimize the error, we can have something called selection logic which bases its decision on a filtered input, in this case a simple first order filter, to produce a pattern of ones or zeros that match the input. Um, Um, in the simplest case, the one we normally think about, the selection logic is just a comparator that says if this voltage is positive, I output a 1. If this voltage is negative, I output a 0. Um, that's a simple logic. But it doesn't have to be that case. We can do something um, a little bit more sophisticated. So um, what we can do is have an input, which is our, the digital word we're trying to do the analog to D to A conversion on. We have our output which filters the error, but instead of um, the selection logic being per sigma delta modulator, we have some sort of um, logic to rule them all. Um, one piece of logic to rule them all. And we have something that is called vector noise shaping. Um, so, for example, we could take the simple sigma delta modulator we had in the previous slide, just double it up. Now we're controlling two outputs. We have the input fed into um, two 
separate filters and we have some global selection logic that says depending on the relative errors of these two lines I will act and produce switch one of these outputs on or both outputs on if that's required to reduce minimize the error that's feeding around this filter section and we can take that further um, we can have lots of um, single bit sigma delta modulators um, and a huge bit of global selection logic which is doing the same thing it's basically looking at all the errors coming out of here um, and it's saying uh, and it's picking the highest the ones with the biggest error are the ones that need to be corrected and it's outputting a one or a naught to make that happen by doing it these outputs will be twinkling along and um, will be benefiting from the shaping of the noise that's provided by the filters associated with each line. Um, sort of, if we collapse it together, we end up with a multiple copies of the loop filter, one for each resistor um, producing an output. Um, we have some logic that takes the input value. Um, say it was three, say, you know, we're putting in um, like our 8-bit bit example and we want to output the value 3. What this logic would do would be to say which of these lines has the highest error and it would take the three, sorry, the three highest values of error and it would use those three resistors um, to produce the output voltage 3. And obviously they would then feed a one back in here and their their, their errors would be reduced um, which would then result in different result resistors being chosen for the next input sample um, and don't worry about this bit here it, 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 in practice when you do the, the numbers on this you get a number that keeps growing and growing and growing so uh, in practice you need to do um, a little bit of normalization at each step just to make sure all the numbers stay within the range of the, the computation device you're using. Um, now this looks um, complicated but actually in terms of programming it or working it out it's fairly straightforward but does it work? Well the answer is yes it does it works exceedingly well and here's two examples of second order noise shaping this is the the first one where we put both of the zeros at DC <coughs> um, and you can see there we've now got dramatically reduced noise at the lower frequencies um, uh, and um, the system's working. This other line here is um, what would happen if we put um, a complex zero in the stop band in the pass band of the uh, D2A converter and there you can see right we've got higher noise at low frequencies but we're now getting a much lower noise over a range of frequencies in the middle which might be of an advantage to um, uh, in some applications so the basic idea works um, so there we are. We can actually, if we do it, we can actually shape the noise of a set of resistors who we, we don't have any idea of what their absolute value is. We don't have any idea of anything like that at all. But what we do know is that they're all the same, that they have an average value and that their variation around that average value is random. And by dynamically selecting which resistors to use to form our voltage outputs, we can actually create a noise shaped, uh, an output voltage where the, the mismatch between the resistors has been shaped up to higher frequencies. And if that isn't audio alchemy, I don't know what is. Um, but even though it seems like magic, it's actually proper engineering and uh, carefully thought out. And you can take that fairly far and use those technologies to provide um, 32 bits of input to these D2A converters. Um, the million dollar question then is, do you actually get 192 dBs of dynamic range out of them? Um, well, let's look at some numbers. Uh, 
a balanced plus and minus 14 volt peak analog voltage would allow for a 20 volt RMS sine wave maximum value in the system. Um, and let's just assume it meets all the specs and it dr can drive that into a 600 ohm resistor. Um, when you work out the noise voltage from that 600 ohm resistor over 22 kilohertz bandwidth, you have a noise voltage of about 0.428 microvolts. So you have a peak signal to noise ratio of about 152.6 dBs. Now that's something like 26 bits. It's just shy of 26 bits. Um, so, um, and when you actually look at the specs of these converters, they do not achieve this sort of voltage output because at the end of the day, we're limited by the fact that we have to live in an environment that sits around 300 or so degrees Kelvin. Um, we could try cooling our listening environments down to 70 degrees Kelvin, but I don't think any of us would find that very comfortable. Um, if we actually work out what we'd need to get 192 dBs of signal to noise ratio, we'd actually need the noise voltage over 22 kilohertz to be 5 nanovolts. Um, and when you work that back into a resistor load, a load resistor value or impedance value, that's less than 0.07 ohms thereabouts. So not really very practical. So may I suggest they're a little bit over-specified. Um, they're obviously designed to be fed from 32-bit processing systems. Um, many of those will actually be these days floating point digital audio workstations, which effectively only have 25 bits of precision in their mantissa, although they're scaled up and down depending on the actual signal level. Um, and w when you look at the uh, specs, some of the early ones of these 32-bit converters actually have less than 32-bit data paths. So if you were thinking about how you might go about dithering your output signal before feeding them to these converters, you might want to consider um, applying dither at about the 24-25-bit um, precision level rather than trying to get 32 bits, because I'm not sure 32 bits is actually practical. And the, the, the last point there is just an idea that perhaps one adds a, a random noise with um, a little bit more detail in it of, uh, on the order of um, uh, 7 to 8 bits of dither. The bottom 7 to 8 bits of your converter is basically dither signal. So, in conclusion, um, Modern DACs use a combination of oversampling and noise shaping, and they do achieve impressive resolutions and even in practice impressive signal to noise ratios, although more approaching 130 or so dB rather than 192 dB, um, because frankly 192 dB is far beyond the capability of practical analog circuitry. And that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Yes, thank you very much. That's been a really fascinating talk. And uh, I think 192 dB of dynamic range, um, that's going from what? A, I think a, that actually a butterfly takes wing to, to, to a jet engine or something like that. Uh, no, I think that actually takes you up to hard vacuum. Uh, I think if you've got 192 dB, um, dynamic range. We're talking about munitions and particularly hyper hyper or hypobaric munitions. Yes. Uh, yes, know, yes. It's it's well yes. beyond the capabilities of era STP. It's no longer sound, it's it's explosions, yes. 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 Um, yes. Boom boom shake the room has a whole new meaning. Yes. Excellent. Um so yes I think we're getting lots of thank yous on the chat as well. One day when we can return to actual physical meetings, we'll be able to give a round of applause. But in the meantime, we'll just have to go with the uh, thank yous and in the chat box. And uh, okay. um, lots of those. Have I filled any of brain up? <laughs> That's the, uh, the, the struggling with the 109. I mean, 
I, I guess as a, as a first question I would ask, 192 dB of dynamic range. Um, clearly that is... How does that fit into the brain? I mean, what do you actually do with 192 decibels? Well, I don't think we can. I mean, you know, we exist at thermal, you know, we basically, everything exists at room temperature or around room temperature. Um, nothing, nothing gives you that sort of dynamic range. I think, to be honest, I think it's 32 bits because we've got 32 bit words and it's 32 bits because you know once somebody produced a 32 bit converter everybody else had to do one as well to keep up with the joneses hmm. um and you could argue it forms a very convenient interface with a 32 bit system it gets more complicated when you start talking about floating point numbers um, because you're going to have to cast them into a 32-bit integer before feeding it to these these conversion systems. I mean, in practice, um, I mean, I quoted 152 odd dBs um, for a fully balanced system. It would be really hard to achieve that in practical cir circuitry. I mean, I think 140 dBs, you know, you can you might be able to do that if you were really 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 careful um but even that would be a challenge so i think in in a sense it's just specmanship um, yes uh however you know these things having said that you know they use th these techniques of noise shape high basically pretty much all the converters that we use use oversampling and some sort of low number of bits at a high sample rate to achieve their output. Um, I didn't mention, because I didn't think I'd have time, although I might have, um, the idea of using pulse width modulation to achieve it instead of switched resistors. And there are a couple of converters out on the market that do that. Um, and at least one I've seen that achieves, you know, quite respectable, you know, again, signal to noise, peak signal to noise ratios in the or in the 140 dB region um, and very high levels of linearity. Um, and uh, um, but yes, uh, do we need 32 bits? Probably not. Um, and the the difficult question there is I saw. I don't think any of the parts available now do this. Certainly some of the early parts, the input path widths for the digital bit was 24 bits. Um, and, uh, y you know, so, yeah, they had 32-bit resolution, but they they didn't really have a 32-bit input. I think all the parts on the market now do actually have path widths that will support a full 32-bit resolution. But yeah. again, um, a lot of that is um, hypothetical, I guess, in terms of whether you can actually achieve that performance. Um, uh, and, I think and that, I, yeah. Sorry, Neil? I was just going to say, I think we've got a question coming from Arthur, and I, th I think you've kind of answered that already, because he's asking um, if there's just a bit detail, you can give us 130 to 150 ish dB of usable dynamic range. What does your typical 24-bit D to A give us? And it sounds like actually that, oh, that's exactly what you're saying. Yeah, a 24-bit converter, 24 times yeah. 6, I think, uh, 4, 6 to 24, gives you 144 dBs of dynamic range. All right. And that we single ended. Now, the interesting thing is, of course, the original professional standard is balanced, um, which gives you an extra 6 dB. Um, so that would give you an extra bit. So you could argue that would give you 150 dBs of dynamic range. Um, and certainly the figures I've seen on real systems, you know, carefully measured, has have been, you know, in the 40 to 50 region. Yeah. But you are talking about keeping impedances low, actually producing a significant amount of power out of your D to A converter, you know, because if you're going to drive a 600 ohm resistor uh, to 20 volts RMS, then 
um, you know, you're talking quite a few milliwatts worth of power going into that. Um, so, uh, and of yeah. course, the heat is your enemy because that's yes, the heat is your enemy because it's going to warm the resistor up and make it noisier. Yes, um, um, I hate to say it, but Johnson noise. <laughs> Yes, it is. Yes, I'm afraid so. Johnson noise, only it's white and uncorrelated. Oh, wait a minute. Um, yes, so, yes. Uh, oh, John Dawson's made a very good point. Yes, with most chips running on three volts, um, you're going to... Um, yeah, I, I absolutely, John. Um, he's suggesting you get about 130 odd dBs, 35 dBs, um, and the the THD is not so good because we're running things at much lower voltage levels um, for reasons to do with um, the chip uh, density on the chip and keeping things cool on the chip as well. Um, so yes, very good point. I mean, I think practically speaking, you're looking at. Um, you know, 130 odd dBs, which is pretty good going. I mean, let's face it. Um, you know, I think 130 dB signal to noise ratio with excellent linearity is probably better than, you know, trying to push it right up to the, the limit and maybe sacrificing a bit on the, the total harmonic distortion or the intermodulation distortion. Um, thank you, John. Good point. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Richard asking in the chat, um, are we going to move to it? Uh, yes. So we'll, we'll just. So, so I think we'll uh, take this last question from Richard Cortis on the chat, uh, and then we'll we will go. Oh, there's one more question, but then we'll go to the interactive uh, discussion. So he's just asking: um, Does a 32-bit converter fill up buffers quicker and thus reduce latencies when having multiple digital to analog to digital conversions in a signal path? I think it's I just more and more bits flowing around. That. So, so again, does a 32 bit converter fill up buffers quicker and thus reduce latencies when having multiple D to A to D conversions in a signal path? Um, I don't see any reason why it would necessarily fill up quicker. I mean, the 32 bit samples are still coming at you at whatever the sample rate is. Um, and mm -hmm. any latency you get is going to be a function of how big that buffer needs to be to uh, satisfy timing variations from your probably from your DSP that's feeding the converter. Um, yeah. uh, there's a there might be a little bit of variation. You might use a buffer to reduce jitter between a computery clock and your final D to A output clock, but that wouldn't require more than a few samples worth of buffering um, and again if we're listening to recorded music um, the latency is really not an issue but I could see where it would be an issue in live things especially for fallback monitoring for the musicians um, yes. you could argue they may not need 32 bits worth of precision coming back at them um, but um, that's so that's a whole different question Okay, um, and one. Um, let's just take one final question from Mike Turner before we go to the interactive uh, Zoom. Um, so he's asking: uh, We can always increase the voltage to circumvent Johnson noise, but yes, surely yes. the point here is how much dynamic range is needed for sound. We are, after all, speaking of audio. If if, if zero dB SBL is a threshold of hearing and 120 is pain, um, is this or a little more not sufficient? Um, I can see what you're saying there. I suppose the argument there might be that we'll have um, all, uh, well, as Flanders and Swan, Swan and Flanders said, all this work to get the exact effect of an orchestra playing in my living room. You know, personally, I couldn't think of anything I would hate more than to have an orchestra actually playing in my living room. Um, but, you know, it's a it's a valid point. Noise levels in domestic environments are probably sitting at 30 or 40 dBA, so you could argue that to get 120 dB dynamic range, you need to be 120 dBs above that. But um, I agree, it's uh, probably not necessary to um, um, to go that far, not even if you're doing the dream of Gerontius. 
um, uh, as a live action thing in your um, living room. I suspect the speakers might want to smoke before you got to that level. Yes, as, as I pointed out to some colleagues at work a while ago, 120, 130 dB is about a metre away from a jet engine. But yes, if you are yes. a metre away from a, a jet engine, your ears are the last of your concerns. <laughs> yes, probably. Um, there's an interesting, uh, towards a true achievement of dynamic range or something like that by George Izzard de Overing, appeared in Wireless World in, I think, 1972 or 71, April issue. It's, uh, it's an interesting read. Excellent. So I'm just posting the link to the uh, Q&A meeting that we are about to switch to into the chat. So if everybody wants to uh, click on that link and then uh, we unfortunately once we close this meeting all this stuff disappears so copy and paste it now and yeah, then yeah. we will retire to the meeting for a more um, interactive um, yes Q &A session see everyone so, there on the other side so it just remains for me to say thank you once again to Jamie and thank you to the AES for hosting all this and uh Look forward to seeing you all soon. Don't forget, next month, October, is the AES Online Fall uh, event. So please register for those events. There's a, a lot on the programme. It looks great. And, uh, yeah, we'll see you there. And our next UK talk will be in November. Right. So, see you on the other side, people. Bye. Bye-bye.